Hello. So welcome to beekeeping, good or bad. And it's good to see that you're um, here, ready for this today's webinar. Despite the rain, we've had horrendous thunderstorms here. We've had power cuts. So I hope I don't get cut off at all today. And I can hope, hope you can still hear me with the raindrops. If you're watching this on replay, then hopefully it isn't still raining. And um, I look forward to seeing any of your comments. So please like, share, um, whatever you're watching this on, on Facebook or YouTube, do put comments in. Um, we can see them. Make sure you allow StreamYard to have your name so then I can see who you are. So um, now on every webinar that I've been doing, I've had a certain percentage of people who want to go deeper on each of the topics and get more personalized help. So to that end, I'm going to tell you today about a rare opportunity to be part of my live virtual course on naturopathic beekeeping, which starts next week on Thursday, September the 3rd. So um, it's live because you'll get to talk to me in real time and it's virtual so you can attend anywhere in the world as long as you have Internet. Now, it might be just right for you now or maybe another time when I will run the course again, or perhaps never. But regardless, it's good to know what's out there for when you're ready. And as they say, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. And I've had so many people asking to have more information about how to keep bees, and particularly in the naturopathic way that I, I advocate and that I've been practicing for nearly 10 years. So you can use what you've learned on all my free webinars to get started on your own. But having an expert like me to work with can make the whole process easier, quicker, more cost effective and enjoyable. Because I can tell you what you don't need to buy. You don't have to just go and get a blanket starter kit and buy everything. And there's lots of things that you can hire or borrow or share. So. During the webinar today, if you can add your questions, insights or comments as we go, and then I will do a question and answers session at the end. So um, just type in your questions and then we will get to see them. And do type and say hello because it's just lovely to know who's here and who's watching. And then, um, yeah, give me any feedback. So hello, I'm Paula Carnell and as you may know, my work is all about the bees and how the bees are key to saving our planet. But is keeping bees the best way to save the bees? And that's what I'm talking about today. The real question is, is beekeeping good or bad for bees? I love this saying. It's an ancient Slovenian saying, which says those who know how to treat bees need not to fear their sting. And I think this is so, so true. And one of the big questions um, or the most frequent questions I get asked when I'm talking to people about bees and beekeeping is how often do you get stung? And it's really lovely because the more I work with my bee team and the more we discuss this with our friends and family, almost all the time you get stung because of your own fault. It's something that you've done wrong. Um, and even if it's an accident where you've squashed a bee because you've picked up something and they're sat on it, but it is always our fault. We've gone into the hive at the wrong time. So I think I love this saying because it really covers the fact that if you know how to treat bees, you don't need to be so scared of them. You don't need to be fearful that they're just out to get you and they're gonna sting you at the first opportunity. So what do I do? So I work as a beekeeping consultant. I'm a speaker and a writer. I have published books that you can see on my website and I've got some behind me. And I'm just really passionate about sharing my methods of beekeeping, which combines with my own knowledge about health and well-being and also my studies of herbal medicine. So I'm a naturopathic beekeeper. So I'm following the naturopathic methods for health and well-being, not just for myself and human health, but for that of my bees. And by using the whole naturopathic methods, um, I ensure that my bees are healthy and strong and able to cope with what the environment and human population are trying to throw at the bees at this time. So 
I was inspired by this, this whole subject by an amazing speaker, um, a Professor Peter Neumann, who's from Bern University. He's the chairman of, um, or the president of COLOSS, which is a big international organization which investigates the cause of death of bees. And you may have heard of, of the bees being lost through colony collapse disorder and the effects of pesticides, the effects of um, lack of forage, weather, climate change, all these aspects that are affecting bees. And Peter Neumann has done many, many years of research um, on what is actually killing the bees. And he states that the biggest, the biggest risk to bees is beekeepers. Now you imagine that's quite a shock to hear. So why? Now you have to understand that beekeepers love their bees. So if they are a threat to bees, it's not on purpose. Beekeepers are not going out of their way to kill the bees. So it's finding a way of what is he trying to say and what can we learn from his studies and his evidence that says that beekeepers are the biggest risk to bees. So is beekeeping actually helping the insects that we love so much? Well, why do I keep bees? I mean, I'm a bit of a romantic and I used to be an artist and growing up in Dorset, I really um, was very much involved with anything Thomas Hardy. And one of my earliest thoughts or memories of bees was actually Bathsheba Everdeen catching a swarm um, in the film Far From the Madding Crowd with the beautiful Julie Christie. And I thought it was so romantic with her veil and her linen dress and the, such a strong, independent woman, but caring for bees. And then, of course, there's Winnie the Pooh who liked honey. So these, these were my background thoughts about bees. And I ended up having my first hive as a gift from my husband whilst I was very sick. I was sick for seven years, bed and wheelchair bound with Ella's Danlos syndrome. And trying to think about what I could do because I could no longer paint and what I could do. And keeping bees was one of those things that I thought I will be able to keep bees. And so I nagged my husband and he bought me this beautiful WBC hive and we put bees in it from a local mentor. And there's a lovely story about how bees came into my life through and got into that hive. And that's in my book A to Bees. But it was something I could do watching from my bedroom window. So everybody has different things that bring them into wanting to have bees but then having bees is not just a simple thing the moment you have bees and you put them into a hive you have a responsibility for them and there are lots of organizations and lots of groups that are encouraging people to keep bees but it can be too much information there's so many different choices and so many options so there's lots of benefits to beekeeping a lot of people come into beekeeping because they want the honey but there is the health and well-being. There's more and more research now that shows that beekeepers live longer, they're healthier, they tend to be calmer. And I suppose it's the more that you work with bees, you know that to no longer be fearful of their sting, you have to understand the way that they work. And whenever you're in the presence of bees, you need to be calm and very present. And so that really does help with your health and well-being. So if you think that you're not a meditator or you're somebody that can't relax or be calm, then you would have to learn quite quickly how to have these qualities if you're going to be a good and unstung beekeeper. So also for conservation, I mean, we're hearing about the bees lo being lost. And so people say, yeah, I want to save the bees. I want to save the bees. And therefore, I need to have a hive. And then there's the important fact of pollination. So if you're growing fruit or vegetables in your garden, you want to have lots of bees who will pollinate it. And those who do have bees or even people who start planting more things for bees in their garden, they notice there's more bees. You plant the forage and the bees will come. If you put bees into your garden, you're going to see them and you're going to get bigger crops, juicier fruit. Um, and you'll see the benefits of the bees in your garden. So there's lots of benefits, but that's for us. So what about for the bees? Well, there's two main camps of beekeeping. There's the natural and the conventional. And of course, I come somewhere in the middle with my naturopathic method. So the conventional is all about the honey. It's about how can you maximize, how can you farm bees so you can get honey? So it's looking at the product. It's thinking, we love honey. How do we get the maximum amount of honey from our colonies of bees? 
the um, more natural way of looking at beekeeping is nothing to do with honey. It's more about the conservation. And in actual fact, it's shunned to take any honey. Now, I believe we have a spiritual connection with bees. And so I'd like to take honey. And I believe that the bees produce enough honey if they're cared for properly, that they can share it with us. Then there's the treatments, the way that you manage your hives with a natural method you'll be using. You'll be working a lot more with the natural rhythms of bees and you could be encouraging their grooming, their natural grooming, either through not taking honey or through um, using a bee gym. And actually, there's more and more science that shows now that the more bees are left to their own devices, they can actually they can genetically evolve to be more. Um, resilient against the threat of pests and diseases and particularly as I spoke about a couple of weeks ago with propolis propolis is an amazing product that the bees produce to keep themselves healthy so by working in a natural way or a naturopathic way you're encouraging those those natural defenses to be stronger with conventional beekeeping it's a lot more about using chemical treatments about clipping the wings of the queens, about managing the amount of drone brood and about um, how you're going to have your bees mating and introducing queens and culling the queens that you don't want. So there's quite a lot of intensive um, interfering, I suppose, and that that's the difference. And that's the kind of thing that we need to um, consider is influencing Peter Neumann's statement that beekeepers are the biggest risk for bees. So disease prevention and cure, that is a, a real contentious issue with natural and conventional beekeeping. And I will talk in a minute about um, one of my gurus who's been talking a lot about disease prevention um, in a more natural way. And then there's habitat. So where you put the bees, the kind of environment you're putting them in. So are the bees going to be in a natural or a hive that is mimicking their natural rhythms, either in the space or are you going to put them in something that is easier for humans to extract the honey? And a lot of beehives have been evolved purely for honey extraction. So these are going to have a big impact on your the health of your bees and actually the well-being of your bees and whether or not it is good or bad for the bees when you're keeping them. I love this quote from Heidi Herman. We don't want a farmer with a million hives, but a million people with one hive. And I love this. I have nothing against the big beekeepers and the, the honey producers because we need them. And most of them are really, really great at caring for their bees and very um, they they have to be so aware of the well-being of their bees, because if they lose their bees, it costs them more money. So it's not just about that. But if people have a hive, it's not just a case of. Um, they can have their own honey or they're not buying honey from anywhere else. It's because it introduces them into their connection with nature. And it's that connection with nature and the connection of all things which gives us a more sustainable way of living and helps us all understand our place in the connection of all things. One of the issues about having hives, and this is one of the, the questions that I, I often raise when people say to me, well, I really want to help the bees and I want to have a beehive. You have to think about this quite deeply because by introducing 50,000 hungry mouths into your back garden, what's going to feed them and at what cost? So you have to be sure that you've got enough food to feed not only the 50,000 bees you're bringing into your environment, but all the existing pollinators, all the solitary bees and the bumblebees that perhaps you've never even looked for or weren't aware that they were there. And this is one of the problems with beekeeping is that by introducing more and more managed hives into an environment without consideration for the native bees, that is what is causing a big problem for pollination because a lot of the native bee species, the solitaries and the bumblebees, they're the ones who do the majority of our pollination work. So for instance, one solitary bee, um, a red mason bee, can do the work of 250 honeybees in an orchard. So they really are important. So you could be saving the bees, not from having a beehive, but if you're really adamant about having a beehive, it will add so much value to your life. And as those of you who've seen me over the last 30 years or even, you know, even longer, 50 years, you'll see how much bees have taken over my life and become such um, a core part of my whole being. And I believe my purpose is to 
educate people on how we can work with the bees and our connectiveness with the bees for our own survival. So bad practices. So what are the bad, stressful beekeeping practices? Well, there's over manipulation. You can be taught that you have to open your beehive every week to actually check what the bees are doing inside. Now, we do need to keep an eye on our bees. And I check my bees every week, sometimes more frequently than that. But I'm not opening the hive up. You can learn so much from looking at the outside. So what I like to teach is what are the signs you're looking for? What is it you're watching when you're seeing bees coming and going? And what can you tell about what's going on inside the hive from the behavior outside the hive? Now, I once read that once you open up a hive, it can take 10 days for the colony to reestablish its balance, to re gain its, its core temperature. They need to keep a steady temperature for the brood to survive and um, just to have a healthy environment. And by opening up the hive and lifting out all the frames, you're disrupting that. So not only does it affect the temperature and the ability to regain that temperature, you're also opening up and cracking all the seals, all this um, the propolis that holds the hive together. And this is their special antibacterial skin that keeps them safe, keeps them protected. And you're opening that up every time. Now that costs them a lot of energy to make this propolis. They have to go to trees and collect the resin and they have to mix it up in their hives and manipulate it. And you know it takes a long time to fill up a gap, even a small size. So by opening up the hive, you're damaging that every time. So over manipulation can be really stressful for the bees. And also imagine they don't know what we're going in for. They might think we're always going to be trying to steal honey and might not understand that we're actually trying to help them. Repeated transportation. So we often have to move bees for one reason or another. We collect a swarm and we have to move them to put them in a hive. Or if bees are in a place that it's just not suitable um, for whatever reason, then they need to be moved. But what is really damaging for bees is when they're put on trucks for the whole of their lives, for the whole season, pollination season. So from February to September, traveling on big trucks from orchard to orchard to orchard, only having a couple of weeks or a few weeks at each place, just to pollinate. This is extremely stressful, which you can tell from the figures of the losses of bees through that kind of moving. And the reason that bees have to be transported like this is because of the loss of the native pollinators. There are no more solitary and bumblebees for a lot of the large monocultures. And so they have to import, bring in honeybees to do that important pollination. But as I said before, if one um, red mason bee can do the work of 250 honeybees. You imagine how many millions and millions of bees have to be shipped in to pollinate one of these vast monoculture, say the almond um, orchards. So this transportation is very damaging. It's disorientating. The bees take time to adjust to each environment and they're being shipped at night and a lot of bees are lost. Taking all of the honey. This is one of the things that broke my heart when I first started keeping bees was the, the, the wonderful, exciting time when you open up a hive and you're told that you can take this whole box and you spin it all out and you have all these jars of honey and you're just like, oh, wow, I'm so excited. But then when you go back and you have to give them a syrup because you've taken all their food. So you imagine somebody coming into your home and taking your whole larder, things, all your dried goods, all your crops, all the vegetables you've grown, grown all through the summer season, taken them all away and replaced it with a big bag of sugar. And that's what you're going to feed on for the for the whole of the winter. Now, I don't know about you, but I know I would not be feeling very well just within a few weeks of a diet like that, let alone six months. So it's really important I believe to be leaving as much honey as you can for the bees so that the the only honey you take is the surplus. And that's how we were originally taught. But that has now been tilted very much to say it's acceptable to take as much honey as you like. And as long as you replace it with sugar, then that's OK for the bees. But I don't believe it is. And smoke, what does it really do to bees? Even this morning, there was a beekeeping um, forum on Facebook where there was a discussion about smoke. And I'm really encouraged to see that there are more and more beekeepers who are no longer using smoke. And smoke was one of the first things that I questioned about beekeeping 
because from my own health journey, I understood about the stress response. And when I it was explained to me that this, you use the smoke in a beehive because it makes the bees go deep into the hive to gorge on the honey. Um, and they gorge on the honey because they think there's a fire and they may have to abscond, they may have to move. And if they move and they haven't got enough honey, they can't make new wax comb. Bees need eight kilos of honey to make one kilo of wax. So they have to gorge themselves. So on the one hand, you're filling the bees and not doing whatever else they should be doing or they were planning to do because they do really know best what they should be spending their time doing. And instead, you're smoking them, creating a stress response, which then affects the digestive system. And if you're doing this every week, then the bees are almost constantly in a situation of stress, in a um, unable to relax. And as studies um, show, which I have talked about many a times, is that bees, to be really healthy, they spend the majority of their time resting. So they're actually um, almost meditating. They're storing their, their fuel, storing their energy so that when they have to suddenly move or when they have to build more wax or when they have to a big nectar flow, they've got the resources to do it. And I found over the last few weeks when it's been raining, and we've, for whatever reason, we've had to open a hive, but not right up, but we've lifted a lid. And the calm and the peace is extraordinary. So in the rain, they can't fly, but it's a magical when you lift up, you take a sneaky peek and the bees are so quiet and calm and they really are resting. So I love the comparisons with humans. You know, if we rested more, we're much more effective when we do do our work. And so the bees are the same. So feeding sugar. Now, this is a photograph I took in Canada for a lovely company, but a very, very large um, honey production company who have thousands and thousands of beehives. And of course, there's a big market for honey. They produce lots of honey. And I saw these trucks and I thought, oh, they're transporting honey for their customers. But in actual fact, that was sugar syrup. They have so many trucks of sugar syrup because when they've taken the honey, they need to feed the sugar syrup to their bees. And uh, apart from the expense, it does seem crazy to me that the bees are bringing in honey, they're collecting nectar for free from all these plants, and yet that food is taken away from them and then substituted with sugar. So really, um, you know, it's a huge expense for them. So is that really necessary? And how stressful is that to the bees? And even the beekeepers, you know, and then it also from an environmental situation, you have um, a huge demand on production of sugar to be feeding bees. So, you know, that's a bit crazy. And then there's a lot of chemical treatments. And this is also quite um, a contentious subject. I just have to look at the image of the mask and the gloves and the goggles. And if that's what we've got to wear when we're putting some of these treatments inside of a hive, what is that doing to the bees? And if you use a chemical treatment to get rid of certain pests, if you have one of those single pests, so for instance, a varroa mite surviving, you've then developed a chemical, um, a treatment resistant pest. And because they're, um, because of the way that they um, procreate through the summer months, you have several generations within a few months. And so they're evolving so much quicker than we are or even than the bees are. So it's almost impossible to keep up with them. So I'm not saying we should be going back to climbing trees and just cutting off bits of comb as and when we need them. But how do we keep bees sustainably without smoke, sugar or chemicals? So this is one of my gurus. This is Professor Tom Seeley. And I saw him in Canada last year and absolutely in inspiring scientist. He's been in, um, studying bees since the 1970s. And he's particularly well known for his um, studies of not only wild colonies in forests, in the Arnott Forest, but also managed colonies. So he's one of the leading experts in the world of comparing bees in hives with bees in trees. And his research is just absolutely fascinating and really gives me confidence that I know that the way we are practicing beekeeping is actually helping the bees.
So he says Darwinian beekeeping, which is what he calls his form of beekeeping, tells us that everything that colonies do when they are living on their own is done to favour their survival and reproduction. So that reminds us that bees aren't out there to try and commit suicide. You know, they want to survive. They want to thrive. They need to do well. And so um, by allowing the bees to get on and do what they know is right and to adapt to whatever situation is is being thrust upon them, they do actually survive. And his, his books on the life of bees and um, the democracy, the democratic behaviour of bees, so how they swarm, it's just absolutely fascinating. And he's a scientist and he is saying the bees do better when we stop interfering and when we stop using chemicals. However, if you do this method of beekeeping, you still need to know what it is you're looking for and how to take care of your bees. Because as I said before, if they're in a hive, you have a responsibility for them. And you have to understand that from watching their behavior and observing things that you can keep track of when they get into trouble and when perhaps you can assist. So what's the kind of good and less stressful beekeeping practices? Well, there's different hive types. There are so many beehives. And for the people that join my beekeeping course, my naturopathic beekeeping course, you'll actually get um, an ebook of, um, all about the top beehives and the differences between each beehive and which ones are good for whatever type of beekeeping. So this hive here is actually a bait hive and it's based on a golden hive and it's a deep box so the bees are able to make longer comb. So it's much more in alignment with how the bees would be in nature. Also it's hung up in a tree so it's a good safe environment for the bees. They're high up from badgers, from predators, you know, even humans have to go up on a ladder if they're going to steal any honey. So it's looking at the different types of hives and how you could open a hive, minimising the stress to the bees and giving you the most observance or um, availability for observing the bees with the minimal interference in the goings on inside the hive. Swarming. Swarming is so important. I'm just going to show a video and I hope you can still hear me while I talk. But this is a swarm I had in my back garden where I actually had two queens. So there's a big cluster behind and then there's this small little leaf with um, a virgin queen and a handful of bees nursing her as they decide where they're going to go. Now, bees swarms for lots of reasons and it's perfectly normal for a colony to swarm and it's healthy. If a colony is really sick, they're not able to swarm. And if a queen has had her wings clipped or if there aren't enough drones or if there's just the whole balance is wrong inside the hive, then they can't. And by swarming, they give a brood break, which actually creates a break in disease. So a lot of the mites and parasites, they need this constant supply of um of, of bees that they can feed off of. And if the bees, the healthy adult bees have left and there's a break before there's some more brood, then there's no food for the parasites. And so they will die out. So swarming is so important. And we need to learn that swarming is not dangerous. It's not putting humans under threat. It is a natural, incredible occurrence. And anybody who has stood in their garden and seen or heard a swarm going overhead, it really is quite magical. And we need to appreciate the wonder of it rather than see it as um, a negative thing or a threatening, a threat to us. So less manipulation. So as I talked about earlier, it's opening up the hives can be very disruptive. And this is a good little photograph because it shows the queen cups. So these are the cups at the bottom of a frame where the bees will have um, fed a uh, um, larvae to become a queen and then that queen will have left and created a swarm or or would stay in the colony and the old queen would have left so it's important to be able to open a hive and understand what it is you're looking at but you need to plan your time very carefully and be very focused about what you're doing when you do open a hive so that you're not upsetting a natural balance so the minimal transportation. So I do have to move bees. Sometimes they've they've gone into people's roofs or into their gardens where they don't want them. Or perhaps there is a new threat where you have a hive and you need to move it. But this is the kind of truck that's shipping 
hundreds of hives in one go, taking them from one place to another. And notice the big tank at the back, which is full of sugar syrup, ready to feed the bees as soon as they get to their new lo location. So really thinking about that whole industry of moving bees around. And if we had more of our native pollinators, then this would not be so important. And then there's only taking some of the honey. So don't take all the honey, just take some of it. And here we are with the bee team and we're just taking individual frames and we're going through the hive so that we're leaving the bees a mixture of frames. So we're not taking all of one crop, we're gonna leave them a variety because the bees put the different nectars in different places around the hives. And so just like we would not want to be left with one um, source of food in our larder for the whole winter, neither do the bees. So they will self-medicate. They'll go from dandelion to bramble to lime um, to clover and they'll move around the hives. So what we do is take individual frames. And so not only are we giving the bees a better diet, but we're also then having more variety in our honey. So by processing small quantities, which you can do if you have your own bees in your garden, you might notice that they're all feeding on the borage and you can take one frame and you've got your one frame of borage honey. And wouldn't that be delightful that you know that the honey you've got has come from the flowers in your garden and it's that fresh. So it's understanding the whole flow of how your bees work about the environment they're living in, when the honey flows are in, and when it's safe to take honey to make sure that you know about when it's capped. So, um, and then there's smoke alternatives. So I've not used smoke. I had to use it to pass a bee exam, but other than that, I've, I've not used smoke. And I've been using water sprays or a lavender and water spray for a long time now. There's also methods of using almond oil, but you have to be really careful if you use almond oil because there's two types of almond oil. There's a sweet almond oil and a bitter almond oil. Now the sweet almond oil is sweet and it will just gently move the bees away from your area, supposedly. So you might want to be using something because when you are opening a hive or you're putting a hive back together again, you want to make sure that you're not squishing bees. So you do need to work quite slowly and you can work without anything if you're working very slowly. But if you do need to put the hive back together again for whatever reason, it does help to have something that will move them swiftly. Now, sometimes we just use bits of grass and we'll just sweep them out of the way. You can blow a bit, they don't like that. They don't like human breath on them, so that will make them move. Um, but the problem with bitter almond oil is that it releases cyanide, and that used to be used to actually kill colonies so that you could take all the honey. Obviously, you're gonna have some cyanide contamination in your honey if you do this, but this is was an ancient way of getting rid of um, the the bees if you want to take the honey so there are alternatives we don't have to use the smoke so i'm coming back to this wonderful quote those who know how to treat bees do not need to fear their sting and what a wonderful saying so what i'm hoping to teach people is how to not fear their sting so some of you have asked for a few more specifics about what you're gonna get on the course and what we'll cover. So I'll cover that about the main course and there's also a VIP option. So then you know if it's the right thing for you at this time. Bear in mind, we're starting next week. So I go through all the different types of hives. So I cover Ziedlers, Nationals, WBCs, Worries, Top Bars, Freedoms, Golden Hives, Flow Hives, Skeps and Sun Hives. Now for many of you, you would have no idea what any of that means. And that's why you need to come on a course because you could go to a, a bee group and they'll just say, oh, you just have to use a national hive. Or quite often mentors will say, use the same hive as me and we can share parts. Well, you should not be sharing parts because that's how you can transfer disease. So that's one reason not to do that. But also, everybody has their own reasons for keeping bees and their own demands from the hive or requests or what you want to give to the bees. So by choosing the right hive for them, you're actually choosing the right hive for you. But you need to understand the differences and why there are so many different types of beehives. And then where do you place a hive? Just how you orientate a hive can make a huge difference to their survival. Um, you need to know about orientation for the bees flying, coming and going. You need to know about landmarks. I also teach about dowsing so that you can ensure that the bees really are on the right spot for your in your environment and for what you want to give your bees. So there's a lot 
to do with placements. So if you have a garden, where is the best place in your garden? You need to know about their flight direction and their most um, dominant preferred way of traveling. And so are they gonna be flying straight into a living room window? Is your house on a route between an amazing source of nectar? So you need to understand this before you place your hives. You've also got to think about your neighbors because if you're keeping bees in a naturopathic way, or if you've got empty hives and you're doing it in a good way, you can be attracting swarms. Not only would your bees be swarming, so you need to really understand about how to prepare for swarms, how to capture swarms, and how to not upset your neighbours. Um, particularly if you're not going to have any honey to share with your neighbours, it's really important that you know how to care for your bees. And so the swarming, as I've said, that's a real key factor on where you place your bees, because quite often the bees have a habit of where they're going to go. They they have preferred ways of swarming and preferred places to land. So by looking at your environment and your garden and your area, you can predict where the bees are going to swarm and therefore have a bait hive there ready to catch them. So you're not going to be upsetting any neighbours or losing any of your swarms. And maybe you've got an allotment. What a super place to put bees. So then you can actually um, be putting the, um, the bees to pollinate not just your fruit and veg, but all your neighbours. But again, you've got to be aware of the flight paths and the risks of swarming. And if you've got an orchard, perfect. The bees love orchards. But you have to be aware that an orchard could only be flowering for three to six weeks of the year. So what is there to feed your bees for the rest of the year so that you're not having to move them somewhere else so that they can still be fed? And then finding your bees. How are you going to get bees in the first place? I do not advocate buying bees from around the world. So I have found that bees will choose the beekeeper and um and beekeepers will choose other beekeepers. So you may know a beekeeper that produces bees or has nukes that you would like to buy from, and that's good. It's good to have bees from your natural, your local environment, so that you can actually, um, you know that they're resistant to the weather, they know their way around, and they're aware of what predators they're gonna have. Um, wasps and hornets can be predators for bees. And so again, your timing of when you put bees in and the location can really help make a difference to their survival. So you can buy nucleus of bees. So that will be from a local beekeeper who's done a split or has collected a swarm and maybe has got some, some smaller colonies that they will sell you. And that's a good way of getting your bees. Um, and swarms. So. So many people are scared of catching swarms, but it's one of the best ways to collect your own bees. And it's great practice. You get to understand your bees. You get to see them from day one. And so I will talk to you all about how you can collect swarms, how to keep a swarm. Swarms are very tricky. They might be easy to catch, but they're very tricky to keep them in a hive. So there's all sorts of tips and things that you can do to try and ensure that not only do they stay in your hive, but that they expand and get healthy so you're not too disappointed straight away. And then splits. If you've actually got a colony and you feel you want to prevent them from swarming, or you've got a friend who's got a colony and they're offering a split, it, it's a really good way of naturally, or of triggering, triggering the natural behavior and expanding your colonies, but in a less disruptive way. And in my work, we have quite a lot of success with splits. So pests and diseases, you have to know about pests and diseases. I won't go into them all now because it will put you off. But my key belief is if that you have a healthy immune system, you will be able to fight off the pests and diseases. And so that is really, really important. So with pests and diseases, I will tell you about all the threats. I'll tell you what you can do, what you could be advised to do, all the different choices so you can choose what you do want to do and what you don't want to do. It's better to have all that knowledge and to be able to justify your choices. We need to be informed. If you decide to go treatment free, you need to know why you're treatment free and you need to be backing that up with other types of care for your bees to ensure that you're not putting your bees at a greater risk of disease. 
And then how much time does beekeeping take? People worry that it's going to take forever. And, and if they go to some of the courses where they're told that you've got to open them up every week, then you're thinking, gosh, I can't do it every weekend and not through the summer. Um, you're going to be busy with the bees in May. So conventional beekeeping every week, you'll be looking at your bees. Um, but with a more natural way of beekeeping, it's not so intensive. And actually, the time that you're spending with them is time you're choosing to spend with them. It's relaxing, therapeutic time. It's not a stressful time where you're terrified of being stung. It's a time of sitting by your hives in the morning with a cup of tea and just watching them and just listening to the buzz, getting to understand how they're doing and how they're thriving and what sort of things you can do to help them if you need to. So you could also have wild bees, and that's a great way of understanding about bees. So when you go walking in the woods or walking in your parks, get into the habit of looking up. And particularly the best time of years for this is a bright day in November or a bright day in February where the bees will be flying, but you haven't got all the leaves on the trees. So you can look up high and if you see clusters of bees flying around, then you know you've got a wild colony. And that's wonderful to make friends with a wild colony and keep an eye on them regularly to see how they're doing. And you'll learn then about how bees in the wild are surviving. So I will help you to stay focused so you can get traction and make it happen sooner rather than later. I speak to so many people who've been wanting to keep bees for years and years and years and have just never got round to it. The key thing is as well, everyone thinks about keeping bees in April or May when bees are all over the news. But by then the beekeepers are too busy. It's too late to order your hive because all the hive manufacturers have been busy all winter making hives and shipping them out to the people who've been organised. So by doing a course now and through the winter months, it gets you set and really puts everything in place so that when you do want to have your bees next year, you're ready and you've got everything in place to start your beekeeping. So my introduction to naturopathic beekeeping course, it starts next Thursday. I've been working on this for a year. So it's all about how to get started keeping your bees. Or if you're already a beekeeper, it's how to do that transition from a conventional way to a more naturopathic beekeeping method. So it starts next Thursday. It runs for four weeks. I'm using Zoom meetings and they'll be live. So I'll be there. I'll be doing a presentation and you'll be able to interact. We'll be able to ask questions. I'll be able to answer anything that you're struggling with at different stages in the course. But each session will be recorded and you will have access. And this is exclusive to people who are doing the course. That they have access to all the replays and PDFs and downloads. So there'll be plenty of documents that you can refer to forever. So everything you learn, you'll always be able to read it and use it. So this is the course for you. If you want to get started, but you could use a step by step approach so that you can get good results quickly. You're not having to get confused or go down the wrong route. Perhaps you want to have a deeper connection and understanding of your own bees. You've been watching them for a while. You might have been taking some honey, but you don't quite know what's going on in there or why they might have certain behavior at different times of the month or different times of the, the year and the season. Bear in mind, you're dealing with 49,000 women and a couple of hundred male bees. So they're gonna be affected and have moods. So perhaps you want a virtual handholding as you learn the basics and a structure so that you stay focused. It's very easy to spend hours searching on the internet, just trying to figure out what type of hive you should have. And there's so many, so much information and so many people have their preferred hives but it would be really good to have somebody who says this is why this hive is good this is why i use that hive and i also use that hive now because i use lots of different hives in my work i don't i don't have one favorite so i'm able to have that objective view and this is one of my favorite photographs and this is me running a workshop for beekeepers at babylon star and in south africa and it was absolutely magical and i think this is the kind of image that we have of beekeeping of is being in our suits out amongst wildflowers listening to the birds and the bees and just being at one with nature and that's something that you really get with keeping bees and that's what has kept me keeping bees and has helped them become such a part of my life so perhaps you want to understand why some hives work in different ways to others. 
this is so key and it's so important that you understand why it is you want to keep bees so you can choose the right kind of hive. Perhaps you want to take some honey, but only when it works for the bees. And perhaps you're interested in the magic of bees and their connection to humans. That's something that really excites me. And through my travels in Bhutan and Oman and all around the world, meeting all kinds of beekeepers, I've picked up so many different tips and bits of advice. So, for instance, in Bhutan, they may use smoke, but they use it with herbs. And it's not to calm the bees. They use it to medicate the bees, to actually give them the benefits of certain medicinal herbs. So there's all these little practices that happen around the world. And I love the fact that I'm able to bring them all in together and share them with people on my courses. So perhaps you want to understand more fully the facts and approaches to a more natural approach to beekeeping. So I've only got limited spaces. I only want to take a few people because I really want to give everyone personal attention. Everybody's going to have their unique needs. And that's what I want to be able to cater for. So if you're ready to sign up, just go to the site um, courses.paulaconnell.com. Um, and we're going to have the link in the comments. So you'll be able to link. You'll be able to click there. Now, if you think that perhaps the course isn't for you, this is who it is definitely not for. It's not for people who are only interested in the honey. OK, I'm not interested in just massive honey production. So before each live session, you will have a short assignment to submit. During the live session, I'll cover more specifics about that topic area and then I'll answer all your questions and give feedback on your assignments. So you'll also get access to a private Facebook group to interact with me and others in the community to ask questions, support others and share your images. I would love to see pictures of your bees and Facebook, love or hate it, it's a great platform to be able to form a community and let's have our own little bee colony together. So there's going to be four modules over four weeks. So the first module is why keep bees and choosing your hive. So we work through what your um, your dreams are, why it is that you have felt the bees are calling you and what it is that you want to gain from keeping bees. It could just be health and well-being, could be honey. It could be um, just helping to support your your orchard or the fruit and veg in your garden. The second module is we'll talk about where and when and how to find your bees and also where to place your hives. So where you're going to put them in your garden or your allotment, or wherever it is you're going to put the bees. So this is all the preparation work. And we'll talk about the shopping list of what it is you need to buy, what it is that you don't need, because that's just as important. So you're not spending money unnecessarily. The third module is all about caring for your bees and keeping them healthy. This is the really, really important module. And this is the one that is important that you understand. And the, the documents that you'll be receiving for this, these are the ones you'll be referring back to over many years, because it's so important that you understand when to see your bees are in danger. And then the final module is all about products from the hive and how to extract them. So again, you could go mad and buy, start buying lots of bits of equipment, thinking that you need it to extract various things from your hive. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how you can take different products from the hive in a naturopathic way that's beneficial for the bees and also how you can... Um, you know, what equipment you need to use, the time of year. And then we'll be closing with all sorts of questions or anything, issues that have come up throughout that. And what's great is I've already got people on the course who are existing beekeepers um, who've had one or two years worth of beekeeping. So together, we're going to have all kinds of experiences that we can share. So I really look forward to sharing all that with you. So the four week online course is £247, which is less than it would cost for you to have me as a consultant for, um, well, for half a day. So you're actually getting the benefit of me for a whole month. You can be asking questions, emailing me. We're going to be in a small group. So it's personal. You get the support and encouragement that you need, the simple steps to get started easily and tips on what to buy. So you'll actually be saving money. So it's my way of helping people wherever you are, because, of course, with this year, it's not so easy to actually go out and, and see people one to one. So this is the way that I can help you. but 
by keeping the cost down so that more of you can be helped and get started with the best form of beekeeping to have bees in a sustainable way. Now, from today until Sunday, I'm doing a £30 discount on the price. And all you've got to do is type good beekeeping in the promo code, code tab. Now, the link on the banner here, we're going to share this in the comments as well. But this is the link just to go straight to buying it. So if you know you want to be on the course and you just want to get it now, then just click that link and then type in good beekeeping and you'll get your £30 discount. So if you're ready to sign up, just go now to courses.paulacarnell.com. Look for the links in the comments. It will give you skills and knowledge for a lifetime of sustainable, healthy beekeeping that will serve you and your community because all your neighbours will be so grateful that they're now having more flowers, more fruit, more veg. And it's going to help the world at large in profound ways, because when you start working with bees and keeping bees in a sustainable way, you understand the connection that we all have with nature. And that's my real passion, is that we can walk into a new world where we have a sustainable way of living and that we are taking care of nature and our environment. So when you complete all your assignments at the end, you'll get a certificate, a natural beekeeping certificate from me. So here are a few comments. These are quite funny. And these and I'm just so lucky to have people that I've been able to work with and they've said such lovely things. And I've got a great one at the end, which I almost didn't share. But I think it just makes it clear why you need to be on the course with me. So Joe Bleasdale, who's um, one of my bee team, and he's a very established beekeeper. So keeping bees for over 40 years. And he says, Paula's introduction to natural beekeeping bear important lessons for our own mode of living. How human interference in nature and contamination of the environment damage nature, the health of the planet and mankind. And then Randy, who I also work with, she says, I have worked with Paula as a beekeeper for about three years now. Her naturopathic approach promotes good health, well-being and most important kindness. Paula is an inspiration. Working with her makes you feel like anything is possible. Now, this photograph tells a thousand words or covers a, a thousand words. I can't remember what the saying is now, but... You see here, Randy's in her bee suit, perfectly styled, no veil on. And this was a colony that we were called to help because a badger had attacked them. And they were so calm and gentle that we all forgot to put our veils on. Mind you, we've been back since and we've definitely had to put veils on. However, this shows how somebody who originally was terrified of anything that might sting or even had never worn Wellington boots is now a really proficient and absolutely amazing beekeeper who's really in tune with her bees and then Linda another wonderful beekeeper who says I have a genuine respect and wonder for the bees and she keeps bees in a worry hive in her garden and also helps me with bees and I learn a lot from Linda because she has a scientific background and so she makes sure that whenever I do have any intuition or feelings that I've got the science that backs it up and then Lynn Franks, um, she's hosted me with a, um, a bee tea party that we did last summer. And she says, Paul is a true medicine woman of today's world. Knowledge of the natural ancient ways of healing through her specific and deep knowledge of bees, together with her connection with the natural rhythms and plants of the earth. She has so much to teach us all. So I'm really grateful for Lynn for seeing that. And she's referring, of course, to my studies in herbal medicine, which is for humans. But I found that a lot of what I've learned through that is translatable with the bees and the science on bees is backing up what I'm learning about herbal medicine for humans. So I'm loving the connectiveness of everything. And then Helen, who's a dear friend, who's also been to several of my talks and workshops. She says, Paula is such an inspiring and knowledgeable lady. Her talks are always full of wisdom and her passion just shines through in all that she does. So thank you, Helen. And then I have this one, which I nearly didn't put on because it did make me laugh. 
Joe, in his wonderful um, northern matter of fact way, says, don't bother with the outdated syllabus of the BBKA. Follow Paula's approach to sustainable beekeeping. So thank you very much, Joe. And um, and he's the author of books about keeping bees without fossil chemicals. And he's a really experienced beekeeper and one of my mentors. So I'm very honoured to be working with Joe and very flattered that he appreciates my teachings. So I'd love to have you join us so that I can support you, so that we can learn from each other and help bring this way of beekeeping out into the world in a bigger way. So if you're ready to sign up, just go here. And if you want to help bees, but without keeping them, here's just a little reminder of what you can do. Buy, eat and grow organic food. Stop using chemicals educate yourself and others and purchase power. Remember that everywhere you spend your money has an effect. It has an impact. So every time you choose something that is chemical free, it's affecting the whole environment and it's affecting the way that we all behave and our future choices. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, as well as my books, I have my tea tale, Plants for Bees, which is available on my website. So if you want to know 12 plants that you can put in your garden that will feed the bees throughout the year, this is a really handy practical gift that's very inexpensive to post because it's a tea towel. So I love changing the world by tea towels. So thank you very much. Well done for, for attending this, this webinar. I hope you found it useful. And I am going to now have a look at the questions because I can see that we've got some questions. So, um, oh, here we go. Paul, so what percentage of honey would we take or leave? That's a really, really good question. Um, and of course, it doesn't have a straightforward answer, Paul. So thank you very much for, for joining me today. It's really good to see you here. So what... Um, there is a rule of thumb that the bees need to have about 20 kilos of honey to get them through the winter. And one of the problems we have with climate change is that the warmer and milder the winters, the bees are not gonna go into a state of torpor. And the torpor is not quite hibernation. It's just a state where they are, um, in. they're clustered in the hive and they, are using the minimal amount of energy and they're not flying anywhere and they're clustering around to maintain their temperature so the bees dislocate their wings and they just vibrate gently now when they're in this state which they would do if it was really really cold they don't need to eat much food but if we have a mild winter with where it's wet weather then for a start in the rain, the bees can't fly, but also where it's mild, they're having to um, maintain the, the air circulation within their hive. And so they're having to move around a bit more. And if it's not raining and it's warm, then they want to fly. But if there's nothing for them to feed on, if there's no flowers, which we tend not to have through the winter months, then they really, really struggle. And so they're gonna need more food. So as a rule of thumb, if you have a national hive, which is your standard sort of commercial or, or um, most beekeepers would have a national hive. It's a standard box and you would have a brood and a half, which is and the half is a super where you put the honey. So you know then that you've given them an extra 20 kilos of honey. And then inside the brood, they tend to store quite a bit of honey and the brood has bigger frames. Now, what we do is um or i particularly do with my bees is i watch them through the year now some of my colonies will have three or four supers of honey so what conventional beekeepers might do is take all three or four of them and just leave either the top one or maybe even not leave that for the bees to get through the winter but what i do is i sit it's a bit woo woo but i sit with my bees and i meditate and i just say okay girls it's rent day next week we're going to come and take the honey how much can we have? Now, when I first introduced this idea to my B team, they all raised their eyebrows and thought, oh, crikey, who, who are we working for here? However, it worked. And I get a feeling, the bees don't all fly out and, and sort of form numbers in the air, 
but you just get a feeling and some hives will say oh you can have six frames or some hives will say you can have 20 or 15 and what we found is that when we have done what we intuitively felt was the right number when we've taken the right number and we've not taken a whole box we've taken individual frames from different boxes for a start we don't have them covered in bees so it's quite easy to to get them out but also we find that um, we haven't needed to feed our colonies. They've remained strong. And when it comes through to the spring, there is a surplus of honey and then we can take the honey off then. So we find they haven't needed it through the winter months. And last year was a particularly good year for honey in this region. And lots of people were so excited and they took more and more honey from their hives. And I asked the question, why have the bees stored more honey? What do they know that we don't? Now, who knows how they could possibly guess what kind of winter we would have had ahead but we did have a really wet long winter that was mild which is probably the worst you could have for bees because they can't fly there's no forage and they need more honey so i was so pleased that we didn't take too much so some hives we don't take any honey sometimes we take a few frames sometimes we take more um so it does depend but you know, if you're running a business and you're having to provide honey, then the pressure is on to take all the honey. So I hope that helps. So it's a bit of a how long is a piece of string sort of answer. So, um, oh, and I can see that Helma also wanted um, to know about that one. Oh, no, Maggie was going to ask that one. Um, so Helma, here's your question. Oh, thank you. Um, and so really interested to know about the flow of bees. Oh, lovely. So any other questions? Anybody got anything they're dying to know? Hello, Esther, really good to see you here. So I think I'll leave that now then. So I'm really excited about the course next week. It's been a lot of work. It has been a year and then particularly through lockdown not just putting together the content for the course, but understanding the technical aspects. Um, just even trying to do these webinars has been quite a steep learning curve for me. Oh, wow. And um, so I'm really excited that I'm now ready to go and that we're gonna have a month of a real intensive, everything you need to know to get started or to understand naturopathic beekeeping. So if you're um, joining me, then I will see you next week. You'll be getting emails about exactly when the sessions are and you'll be getting your first project so that you can work on that ready for the first class. So um, if there's no other questions, I'm going to leave you. And if you've caught this on the replay, just remember that the discount carries on until Sunday. And after that, it is the full price. Um, but I will be closing entrance on Monday so that you've got enough time to prepare for the course when we start on Thursday. So thank you very much. And um, I look forward to seeing you all on the Naturopathic Beekeeping course or on my next webinar. So take care, have a great weekend. I'm pleased to see the sun's out now and it's stopped raining. And thank you very much.